In London, we have 270 nationalities and 300 languages. And if we are living in a global village, we need to know about our fellow villagers. So today, this integration dinner has been organized so that we could know about our fellow villagers. The organization which is hosting tonight's dinner is World Congress of Overseas Pakistanis, which is a representative organization for overseas Pakistanis, more than 8 million overseas Pakistanis in 144 countries. I have the honor to invite Right Honorable Simon Hughes, a great friend of WCOP, Deputy Leader of the Liberal Democrats, Minister of State for Justice and Civil Liberties, who is going to serve you the best in the beginning. So over to Simon Hughes. Thank you very much. Mr. President, I'm not going to detain you. You're not here to hear me, although you might hear me later. Um, with no further ado, may I invite the Deputy Prime Minister of the United Kingdom to come and address you. Nick Clegg. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, inviting me to this um, magnificent uh, event. Uh, whilst I understand that the World Congress of Overseas Pakistanis has only been in existence for a couple of years, it nonetheless, and an event like this, nonetheless celebrates something of huge scale and of uh, considerable duration as well. The acting High Commissioner alluded to it himself. It is an extraordinary thought that 8 million individuals, uh, Pakistanis, live outside Pakistan and yet uh, provide so much prosperity, so much employment, provide such a contribution, charitable contribution, civic contribution to the communities in which, in which they live. And that by far the largest contingent of that overseas community is to be found here in the United Kingdom. And you, of course, are prominent and successful members um, of, that, uh, of that community. And it is really a, a great delight for me to be here to celebrate all your achievements and everything that you represent. Because you will know better than I do the untold stories of individuals and of families uh, some years ago making perhaps a long uh, journey with some trepidation, leaving kith and kin leaving the, the community and hearth of which they, are, uh, uh, they were accustomed in Pakistan to find a new life here in the United Kingdom, very often uh, establishing themselves in those early years was not difficult, it uh, was not easy rather, uh, dealing with a, uh, discrimination, dealing with economic and social challenges and yet bit by bit uh, innovation upon innovation, entrepreneur after entrepreneur hour after hour of extraordinary hard work uh, the the Pakistani in this community in this country has established itself as an absolute integral part of everything that makes Britain the wonderfully diverse uh, country that it is today and so I really do want to congratulate you I want to thank you and I want to celebrate everything that you represent the ethos of hard work the ethos of of seeking to do the best for yourselves, for your family, and for your uh, community. The way in which you have enriched uh, the United Kingdom in so many uh, different ways, culturally, economically, uh, and, uh, and socially. You are right to be enormously proud of everything that you represent. And you do so as the Acting High Commissioner And you do so, of course, as the Acting High Commissioner said, at a time when the relationship between the United Kingdom and Pakistan is an extraordinarily intimate one. Not only are, is, that, is that relationship underpinned by history, by culture, by a lot of shared experiences, uh, but also by the fact that we trade with each other. Uh, I, want us to, I want to see us trade even more. We've set a target of increasing bilateral trade to £3 billion by 2000. And 15, we have many, many British companies that are active and present and prominent in, uh, in Pakistan. But more than that as well, by 2015, Pakistan will be the largest bilateral recipient of aid and assistance from uh, the United Kingdom, particularly in the field of education. British assistance will be helping 4 million children in Pakistan with their 
with their education uh, by, by 2015. That is the largest educational program of its kind anywhere in the world. And as the acting uh, commissioner, High Commissioner said, we also work hand in glove to make sure that the interests of Pakistan, not just in London, but in Brussels, Berlin, and Paris, and across Europe, are well understood uh, as well. I remember vividly, I will never forget it, flying in an aer aer RAF um, aeroplane in the center of Pakistan in 2010. And before me, I saw this just this biblical sight, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of square miles of countryside submerged underwater in those terrible, terrible floods. And not only did thousands upon thousands of British fellow citizens act generously to provide their own contribution, their own don donation to charities which were there to help uh, those who had to flee their homes and flee their communities. But also, that was the point at which the British government really swung into action to make sure that this new wave of trade concessions would be granted by the European Union towards uh, Pakistan, the so-called general system of preferences plus, which represents or could represent up to half a billion pounds worth of additional export of uh, Pakistani goods uh, to, the, uh, to the European Union. So it is a relationship which is deep, it is uh, intimate, it is of uh, long standing, and it is one that we must all work together to continue to strengthen. And to see here the banners that the integration dinner uh, at this very event is here to promote, as the banners there say, togetherness and coexistence, is especially, of course, important at a time of some heightened anxiety in uh, a number of our communities in this, uh, in this country, at a time of great fragmentation, of great volatility in uh, international, global and foreign affairs. We've seen the terrible large-scale loss of innocent life in Gaza this summer. We have seen the rise of this perverted, violent, barbaric ideology, ISA, which claims which claims to mete out its violence in the name of Islam, and yet there is nothing, nothing Islamic about ISIL uh, whatsoever. And it is an insult to every devout and peace-loving Muslim here and else, elsewhere in the world for ISIL to invoke the name of that great world uh, religion. All of these things are things of great concern to our communities. And frankly, there are people who seek to exploit those concerns, seek to polarize opinion, who seek not to cherish and reinforce coexistence, but to exploit division, fear, and anxiety. And we must all work together to counter the fears, uh, the, the, the forces of division and fear, which are so current, not only here in the United Kingdom, but in politics in uh, many other countries as well. And that's why on top of all the reasons that I've said, I really do wish you all the very best of luck, all the very best of success in your deliberations in the future. What you do, standing up for empowerment, for integration and for coexistence, is of huge, invaluable importance at the best of times. It is especially important in these difficult times which we travel through together right now. Thank you very much. Here, yeah? The Deputy Prime Minister very kindly said he'd stay for a little while to take questions. So the question was about youth uh, unemployment and those uh, youngsters uh, in all communities, but perhaps most especially in, in, uh, in diaspora communities who are unable to find uh, work at the moment. Uh, look, the bad news uh, is that um, in keeping with all recessions, the recession, the crash in 2008, which was on a scale and of a gravity that, um, in my view, is almost without precedent in the post-war period in this country, um, led to a sharp increase in um, uh, those youngsters who are unable to find work. But good news is we've now seen successfully youth unemployment come down, uh, in fact, quite rapidly in recent times, and youth unemployment is now lower than it was now in 2014, it's lower than it was in 2010 when this present coalition government came um, into, uh, into office. Um, now, 
the reasons for that, thankfully, for that decline is principally, of course, because the, grow, the economy is growing again. Because we've had to take these very difficult and, and, uh, um, and downright unpopular, in some cases, decisions to rectify the terrible damage done to our economy. As an economy grows, that creates more jobs, that creates more opportunities. But there are a number of things which I think have been especially effective. We have expanded apprenticeships on a scale that we've never seen in Britain before. So this government, despite all the savings we've had to make, have put unprecedented amount, hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds, into expanding apprenticeships on a scale never seen before. And that's provided a new route for young people to make that difficult journey from education into work. We've also, I, I announced um, uh, two or three years ago, a, uh, something called a youth contract, which is a billion pound assistance to young people trying to find work where, for instance, we, in addition to providing subsidies to uh, employers who want to take on young people to incentivize them to do so, we also massively expanded the work experience schemes available so that youngsters could find, uh, maybe just even for a few weeks, six, eight, 10, 12 weeks, <coughs> the opportunity to work with others in a workplace where they get into the habit of, of working and, of course, also develop an appetite for doing so. Because my experience, and I'm sure your experience is the same, is that the worst thing of all is when you meet a youngster who is sat at home, watching daytime television, feeling increasingly isolated, demoralized, cut off, sending out hundreds and hundreds of CVs, not getting any reply, no explanation about why they don't get an interview. You, you know, that is the cycle of, of, of despair sometimes that needs to be broken. And I think what experience has shown is that Apprenticeships, but a particularly work experience schemes, are an ex excellent way of breaking that cycle of despair, giving people the discipline of, of, uh, of getting out and working. There are many other things as well. We've, we've mobilized Job Centre Pluses to provide more assistance to those who don't have the basic skills, particularly, particularly literacy and numeracy skills. You ask about the future. I'll tell you one thing that I, it's a, it's, a, it's a specific thing, but it's quite an important thing that I have come across. I've come across many, many youngsters we're trying to get good qualifications by going to college. But if they don't live in great big cities like London, where they can travel by bus for free to get to the college, they sometimes have to find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds per year to travel maybe 10, 15 miles, or whatever it is, to the local college just to get the qualification they need to work. So um, I have said, my party have said, Simon and my, our party have said, that we want to provide all youngsters between the ages of 16 to 21 after the next election, if we're back in office, with a two-thirds deduction on their transport costs, their bus costs, which will part fund, by the way, by apologies to anyone who might be in this bracket, to those who, um, which will part fund by asking those wealthy people who are retired in the higher uh, tax bracket to give up their free TV licenses and winter fuel payments. Because we think that it's right to ask people who are well off but retired to make a small sacrifice in order to help the youngsters get to college, to get the qualifications, so they can get into work. Thank you very much. And... I want to know, because the UKIP keeps criticising that Liberal Democrats, Labour and Conservatives are centre-right in the political spectrum at the moment, and that their policies are very similar, would you agree with this opinion and would you say that there is actually no difference between the parties and their main policies are basically quite similar, whereas Liberal Democrats have to be centre or third way, as was created by uh, Tony Blair? It's a very uh, confusing question, I apologise. Right, I, I may have missed some of the last bit. Um, uh, yes, don't get me started on UKIP. Um, apologies for any UKIP members or councillors here. Um, Look, uh, British politics is, is, is very volatile and fragmenting now, much more than I think it has done for a long time. In many ways, British politics is a reflection of the, the wider fragmentation going on in the world that I referred to earlier. And um, I think partly, maybe, the way I can help you um, answer your question is that, traditionally, the way in which we categorise political parties was on this right-left spectrum. So if you're on the right, you believed in free markets, but you didn't believe in the state. You believed in the private sector, not the public sector. You were on the side of the bosses, not the workers. Yeah, you were um, in favour of low taxes, not, you know, not, not, you know, not more money for public services, and so on and so forth. Um, I think in many ways those distinctions, whilst they're still important, 
are much, much less important than they used to be. Actually, nowadays, no one really argues with the basic proposition that you need to have a mixed economy with a vibrant private sector, rewarding hard work and entrepreneurialism to generate the tax revenues in order to fund the kind of public services we need to have a civilized and fair society. So in a weird kind of way, I think the way that we used to categorize this spectrum of opposing views on the right-left view, it might have made sense in a world where it was all, where you know, the whole world was divided between communism on the one hand and capitalism on the other hand. I think all that's gone. I think what's replaced it is a new dividing line, which is really about whether we are an open or a closed country. Uh, and I think you see this over and over again. It's, you know, are we going to be open to the outside world, remain engaged with the outside world, or are we going to pull up the drawbridge? Are we going to be open to people who want to come to this country, work hard, play by the rules, pay their taxes, make a contribution, or are we going to blame everything on immigrants? Are we going to be open by remaining engaged in the European Union, or are we going to pull out of it altogether? And, and that, in my view, has become a much more important dividing line in British politics. And that's, of course, where, since you raised UKIP, where UKIP and the Liberal Democrats, whilst we are, of course, smaller, both parties than Labour and the Conservatives, in a strange kind of way, UKIP and the Liberal Democrats now present the two, the two sides of that equation. The Liberal Democrats, we are, un, we are unashamed in saying and very proud of saying that we think the best of Britain is one where we celebrate coexistence and tolerance and diversity and openness and we don't think it makes any sense in this modern world to cut ourselves off from our own hinterland. We can only stand tall, in our view, in Washington, Beijing, Moscow, if we stand tall in Brussels, uh, Paris and Berlin. We have to be leaders in our, own, in our own backyard. I don't think we can protect ourselves from cross-border crime or deal with climate change unless we work with other countries. So I think my answer to you would be, I think the difference between political parties is less now about left and right and much more about whether we are self-confident about what Britain is in this modern world, open and generous-hearted, or whether we are constantly arguing that we should sort of turn inwards, pull the drawbridge up and turn our back on the outside world, which I think would be a disastrous, disastrous recipe for the future of this country. Um, most of the people, the British-born uh, people, young people who have left teenagers, who have left to fight with ISIS, are uh, from Pakistani diaspora. And uh, there's very um, um, th there's a rising concern amongst the community about that because taking that opportunity, being born here, they know their rights, and probably if they are at the, their uh, emotional side is addressed when they are not wise enough, they probably uh, say yes to any call that would uh, probably w won't be um, consented by their parents. So, can there be any uh, state policy? on stopping those teenagers who haven't come to the age or are very young uh, to go to those kind of areas where we have wars and ISIS involved uh, to stop them and secure their future? Thank you. Mm. Um, well, I mean, in direct answer to your... Sorry, I, literally, I mean, these, these lights are blinding, so I can hardly see you. So um, I was always taught by my mother to look the person in the eye to whom you're addressing, but I can hardly do that. So anyway, you'll just have to... I'm just looking generally in your direction. Um, uh, very specifically, uh, there are, of course, powers that we um, have, and indeed there are powers that we will be legislating on soon in order to, in order to um, allow us to take unusual steps uh, uh, to stop someone travelling to the, uh, the, the, the conflict and the, blood, uh, the bloodshed in Syria and Iraq if there are very well-founded reasons to stop them doing so. so we are, for instance, legislating shortly to give authorities at our borders uh, uh, a right to temporarily remove someone's passport if it, if it is uh, obviously subject to proper oversight and scrutiny and so on. Um, uh, if it is obvious that that individual is intent on leaving to this country to go to Syria and to Iraq with the risk, of course, that they do so, firstly, in a way which will harm themselves, but worse still, that they then come back late in order to harm innocent British citizens here. But however much the state takes on this power or that power or pa passes this law or passes that law, at the end of the day, the greatest antidote 
to the kind of warped, perverted ideas, many of which are peddled by people on the internet, um, many of which are absorbed by impressionable young individuals, as you said, uh, in a way which is invisible to their parents, their sisters, their aunts and uncles, their grandmothers and their grandfathers. At the end of the day, the greatest antidote to that is not to be found on the, on the statute book in Westminster, but it's to be found in the families, uh, the mosques, the communities themselves here in the United Kingdom. And that's why what you're doing here is so extraordinarily important because all of you serve as role models, positive role models, role models of, of individuals who are successful in, comfortable in, and fully integrated in, in, in modern Britain. And the more that you can act as positive role models, to those youngsters, the more that you will provide a, a, an alternative avenue which otherwise may be blocked and distorted by these people who peddle such hateful uh, and, and perverted uh, ideas. And we in government need to work together with you. At the end of the day, I, I wish it were otherwise, actually I don't wish it were otherwise, but governments can't just sort of change what goes on between people's ears by passing a law. People's attitudes, people's fears, people's emotions are immune in one sense to just legislation. That is something we need to do together. That's what families and that's what communities need to do together. And that's why the partnership between organizations such as the World Congress for Overseas, of, for Overseas Pakistanis and the government is such an extraordinarily important partnership now and in the future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a few months ago, your officers asked if it would be at all possible to secure the Deputy Prime Minister to come to talk to your organisation. He has done me the courtesy and generosity of accepting my suggestion and your organisation, I think, the honour of coming and spending time with you and answering your questions. And I'd like to thank Nick very personally for coming to hear you and to talk to you. And I'm sure the relationship will continue as your organisation will grow. Nick, thank you very much. Thank you.